Now, when it comes to John, we have talked about the fact that John has patterns in it and that John writes in cycles. You can see the Revelation very clearly is a book full of repetitive cycles. It's, you know, effectively the same thing over and over, just at different levels of detail or at different perspectives. The Gospel of John is the same way. There are uh, cyclical, if you will, patterns of what happens, you know, the story, the, the entirety of it, and different aspects of it are emphasized at different times. So I'm going to try to bring some of the most prominent ones here and let us talk through them and, and begin to see it ourselves. And I hope that this helps you in the reading of John's Gospel, the point of which is to establish the deity of the anointed, of the Lord's anointed, uh, Jesus the Christ. He is the one who is, in fact, God in the flesh and in whom our faith rests. So it's worth looking at these things and taking from them, I think, the lessons that are there. This lesson is the unlikely messenger, uh, which is something that I came up with. This is not a standard thing, but... Uh, the unlikely messenger is, to me, a pattern of John, and I think the purpose of that uh, is, you know, at the outset, I think the purpose of that is we are going to get the truth in one way or another, and it may not be in the way that you expect. And that's the basic idea. It's actually a pretty old pattern if you look back even in, say, 2 Kings 5, where Naaman the leper, the commander of the army of Syria, goes to the house of Elisha looking for a cure for leprosy. And he doesn't go, the, the prophet doesn't come out and meet him. He sends a servant out with a word about what to do. And it didn't involve the prophet in any way directly. <laughs> and uh, he was kind of upset about that. You know, he had his own idea about what should have happened or what, what this, you know, what should that messenger be? And in that story, you find that it was the servants who came around. You know, he took off in a rage and the servants came around and said, my Lord, did he, is this what he said? Yeah, well, if he had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done that? How much more when he says, wash and be clean? So he went and did it and it worked. He was healed. They came back and confessed that there was, in fact, a prophet, as you may recall in 2 Kings 5. Well, that's an unlikely messenger. He didn't expect to hear in that way. And the truth didn't really sink into that skull <laughs> until the servants appealed to him. That's also unlikely. Well, we start in the Gospel of John with John the Baptist, John chapter 1. John the Baptist is the first unlikely messenger. And by this we mean not what you're expecting. See, in the 19th through the 24th verses, there are people dispatched from the Pharisees to find out who is this guy, why is he teaching and preaching, you know. This is a testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the anointed. He's not the Christ. Very plainly, he says, I'm number two in command here, not number one. <clears throat> and uh, I will comment on this, Who are you? Um... This is more, you know, I think, yeah. this is, um, the way that it's phrased is actually you. Who are you? <laughs> Which is more like, who do you think you are? Just who are you anyway? You know, that would be a better translation to get at what is very clear in the original. This kind of, you know, they show up and they're like, you. Who are you? Kind of 
disrespectful, distasteful. Like, why are you talking? Why should we listen to you? That's the meaning of this. And he confessed at that time, well, I'm not the anointed. Which is very demurring if you think about it. Uh, should they listen to him? Well, yes, they should. But he's not going to say that he's the one. He's not really the one they should listen to. It's the message that they should listen to. So they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, nah. Prophet? Nah. So who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So now we're getting very clear about this. We've got to come back and tell them something. What do you want us to say? You know, They don't like it when we come back empty-handed. See John 7. <laughs> and his response is, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. These have been sent from the Pharisees. So again, he says, it's what the prophet Isaiah said. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. Okay, what we mean by this is the Bible, the scriptures told you that this was coming. You have preconceived notions of what Elijah looks like or the prophet looks like. You've constructed all of this in your mind, but it's not actually what the scriptures say. Here's something from the scriptures. This is who I am. So it's not really, in some sense, it's not answering their question. It's challenging them to go back to the Bible and read it and understand, well, what is the meaning of this prophecy? What is that person supposed to do according to the Bible? And in some sense, it's a challenge to them and their teaching. Have they been teaching that? Have they been preparing the people to look for that? So, yeah, it, in a way it doesn't answer, and in a way it's the perfect answer. It's exactly right. But this is an unlikely messenger, not the guy that they're thinking is the one they should be listening to. These were sent, you may uh, recall, uh, these were sent from uh, the Jews, meaning the establishment sent priests and Levites out from Jerusalem to John, who was in the wilderness. Right? Who has, right, who has the palace, if you will, or the, you know, the, the, the fancy public building? Well, the Pharisees do, right? Who has the governing authority? The Pharisees do. Who has their name on things around here, buildings and and cornerstones and businesses and right the people who are sending to John what does John have well he's got a leather belt and he eats locusts and wild honey <laughs> how does he keep from getting stung I don't know I don't know maybe he had a honey badger as a pet I do not know doesn't say but he did this and he doesn't have the power the influence right the things of the world but he does have the thing that matters the most which is the truth of God the testimony of the scriptures. So the important thing about this is that as weird as the guy seems, he's actually the one who's right because he's pointing them to the scriptures which say this is coming. And they gotta go back to the scriptures and see whether this is so or not. Well, the other thing that John does is to bear testimony. And you know, we read that he confessed already he's not the anointed one. But here we have more testimony. 29 and 30, the next day saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he existed before I did. Well, that's the one. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is his testimony. And he says, this one outranks me. This one existed before I did. Even though, in point of fact, John is conceived first. And in the sixth month of his time in the womb of Elizabeth, his, uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, conceives. So, in what sense does Jesus exist before John? Well, 
in that he is God in the flesh. He has been just as God has been. He has always existed. Just recently took on human form. I myself didn't know him, says John, meaning I didn't recognize him. You know, we grew up together, 30 years old, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. So this Jesus is the one on whom the Spirit descended and remained. And he said, oh, that's the one, my cousin Jesus? Okay, he didn't know. So his testimony, if you say, if, if you put this together, is not his own. It's coming from God. God told him what to do and how to, how to find this out. And this is what's happened. And it happens to be the one to whom angels appeared, or uh, to whose parents angels appeared. And the shepherds knew about it. And the kings came from the east to worship him if anybody remembers what happened in the days of Herod 30 years ago. This is all stuff that they could look up or that they may well have known in some collective consciousness. Well, the 43rd verse, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said, follow me, which he did. But Philip went and found his brother Nathaniel in verse 45 of John 1 and said to him, we found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. Well, what is this? It's another unlikely messenger. That's all. Nathanael's like, I'm not accustomed to listening to my brother Philip. Many of us have such brothers that we don't listen to. Or don't listen to us. <laughs> but he said, the one about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. What's the testimony really? Is it Philip? No, it's the scriptures. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, you know, they're thinking Nazareth is Bubba, you know, Bubba land. You know, that's just not, that's the armpit, you know. Uh, maybe, but, you know, all of it is about the same compared to heaven. <laughs> he came down out of heaven and took on flesh. The nicest of palatial dwellings that we have is nothing compared to his heavenly throne. So, yeah, it's not very useful. Nathaniel said, oh, so he goes to Jesus, and Jesus knows him and tells him something that he only would have known. And so Nathanael said, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip got to you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Which is something that only Nathanael would know. Or uh, Yeah, Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Okay, so now he seems to get it, sort of. Jesus answered, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than this. And that's true. This is also telling of the cycles of John. Right? There's more to it. That's just the beginnings, the rumblings of the scripture says this thing that needs to be fulfilled. And it's in front of you, though you don't realize it. Because it's just not the source that you're expecting. Well, who are the other unlikely servant, uh, the unlikely uh, messengers? We started with John's testimony and those that followed because of John and what happened there. Now we look at beverage servers in John 2. On the third day, this is now the third, you know, we started with John said this thing, there's the Lamb of God. The next day, Jesus goes to Galilee. He's got these with him. The third day, there's a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples too. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine, which is technically not his problem. But he acquiesces. The fifth verse, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> now that's an interesting thing. 
It's showing us that Miriam, Mary, his mother, does know something. She is a woman of faith. We were told she was a woman of faith. She's not just a foil or a character in a play. She is a woman of faith. She knows that there's something else here. And so she goads him a little bit into doing. Already she tells the servants, do what he tells you. Things will work out. That's an interesting thing. And I would argue that she, as a symbol of Judaism, is the same way. We are being pointed by the law of Moses to Jesus. And the law of Moses is a perfect fit for becoming a Christian. You learn how to distinguish clean and unclean, good from evil, how, what, how God should be treated holy, so many other things, right? The mother tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. So are you servant-minded? Jesus told the servants in verse 7, fill the jars with water, which they did all the way to the brim. And he said, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. <laughs> okay. So they did. And the master of the feast, having tasted the water, now become wine, didn't know where it came from. All of the servants who had drawn the water knew. That's the important thing. The servants knew where it had come from. He didn't ask them where it came from, though. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, Everyone else serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor. But you kept the good wine until now. As in, this is odd. Well, that's another unlikely messenger, isn't it? On the one hand, Mary believes in Jesus' power and tells the servants to trust in him. And on the other hand, the servants know what happened and know what they're doing when they take it up to the master. The master doesn't recognize what's going on, but he does recognize that, man, this is a lot better. Usually, you put the good stuff out first. And then, you know, once everybody has enjoyed their dinner, enjoyed their beverages that are really good, then, okay, now they can have the, you know, whatever. Now they can have the canned Cokes and bottled waters. That's fine, you know. But, no, you kept the good one until now. Why is that? Well, because the second overtakes the first. <laughs> Always in Scripture. The New Testament is better than the Old but this is the first of his signs. He manifested his glory in this way and his disciples believed in him. He made his own glory appear. This is the first sign that he did at the urging of a woman, at the urging of his mother, a righteous woman, with the use or the help of servants. The servants knew the truth about it. The master didn't, the leaders didn't know. Would they listen? Would they want to know? How did the conversation go after this with the groom saying, uh, I don't know. <laughs> did anybody ask a servant? Did a servant dare to speak up? What about this unlikely messenger, Jesus with a whip in John 2? You know, this is, tis the season for people to think about a very harmless Jesus a baby, swaddled, you know, completely harmless. But that's not the real Jesus. <laughs> oh, that happened, you know, at a point in time when he was an infant, during which, Psalm 22 says, you made me to trust you while at my mother's breasts. That would be a better way to talk about it. But anyway, I don't think they're really interested in the Bible. But John 2, 14 through 19, here's the real Jesus. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there too, inside the temple with animals and their dung. Uh, no. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. A whip of cords to drive them out. Okay. So this one is following them, cracking the whip. Get out of here. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. That's the, um, uh, now I forget what you call that, but it's the uh, currency exchange. 
I forget what you call it, but you know, when you land in an international airport, there's always some booth there, some stand, some business who will change your international currency into the local, right? That's what these guys are doing. Having this uh, overturned is a considerable amount of uh, uh, disruption for them. It's a, it's a, um, destroys their ability to keep track of what they're doing and have the exchange rate be held. Anyway, he just, you know, ruined everything they were working on. <laughs> he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of trade, which is literally a den of thieves, right? And this is a quotation from the scriptures. That's the point. It is a quotation from the scriptures that he's using. And the disciples also remembered it was written, zeal for your house will consume me, which is true. That's also in the Psalms. And the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So no sign for the immediate action of casting everything unclean out of the temple, just the scriptures, because just the scriptures should be enough. They shouldn't have been doing this. They should have known better than to do this. And, you know, we can't get mad at Jesus using a, a whip to drive animals out. I mean, that's how people drive animals. But it also means business, doesn't it? And this is okay. I mean, you look back in the scripture, there's been, you know, far more severe uh, interventions. If you think of Phineas, for example. So this is fine. Nobody got hurt. Maybe their feelings. But I'm more concerned about God's feelings. And this is his house. So that's an unlikely messenger, isn't it? He showed up. They thought they were doing good because they were selling the animals that people could buy to offer and sacrifice since they had traveled from a long distance and couldn't bring their animals with them. Which is something the law provides for. But it didn't say, do this inside the house of God. It said, obtain these things wherever you may do so. Not turn this house into a den of thieves. Which is another thing that is also an accusation that they're not really being fair with this trade, this exchange rate either. Which is probably true. Grift. It's everywhere. Another unlikely messenger in John is the Samaritan woman at the well in chapter 4. Well, Samaritan is already unlikely. That gets used more than once by the Lord because they don't have anything to do with each other. Samaritans are those who were brought back after Assyrian captivity to take uh, the place of the ten tribes of Israel who had been carried off. And they never really worshipped the Lord correctly. But no matter. Now we are united in the Lord Jesus. But in John 4, 7-9, a woman from Samaria came to draw water at the well where Jesus was seated. He said to her, give me a drink too. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So he's there alone. She comes to draw water. He said, give me a drink too. Samaritan said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans on two counts. One, she's a woman, and she's used to being treated as less than or secondary, which is unfortunate, and it's not how Jesus acts. But another, she's a Samaritan, and the Jews generally, you know, try not to touch them or deal with them. They don't want to get their hands dirty. The woman said to him in verse 25, I know Messiah is coming. He was called anointed. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. She knew that Messiah is coming, the anointed, meaning she knows enough about the scriptures to know that there is something coming. And Jesus said, that's me. 
At which point his disciples came back and marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you look, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Because, <laughs> you know, he didn't question Jesus. We would all have been a little bit afraid, uh, I think. But she left her water jar, which she, she had come down to get water, but she left it there because there's something more important now. Went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the anointed? Because that's what he said about himself. And many of the Samaritans from that town, verse 39, believed in Jesus because of that woman's testimony, saying, he told me all I ever did. So when they came to him, they asked him to stay with them, which he did. He stayed there for two days. He stayed with Samaritans, something that the elites who sent messengers to John would never do. They wouldn't be caught dead over here talking to a Samaritan, let alone be invited to stay and take that invitation. But many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's not because of you, what you said anymore that we believe. We've heard ourselves. We know this is indeed the Savior of the world. It's very interesting. Now, the Samaritans get visited again, you know, in Acts chapter 8, when, you know, they're the first outside of Jerusalem to obey the gospel. When, when the, the church is uh, scattered because of the persecution, they go into Samaria, and you have people obeying the gospel there. Uh, it would very likely be these people. They were ready. They had heard. They understood. But it's an interesting thing to consider this, you know, again, somebody who is generally marginalized in her society and time. Um, and I think that's pretty common for women in the history of human humankind. Um, unfortunately, it's not godly. But she turned out to be well, a real blessing to that people. Samaria heard the gospel. Samaria had God in the flesh stay at their house for a few days. That's pretty great. And it's because of this woman at the well who was willing to be challenged by the Lord who called her on her sins, which she did have, but it's clear that she changed her mind. That's good. But... She was willing to let that happen because she knows and loves truth and said, I know Messiah is coming. So very powerful, I think. An unlikely messenger. In John 5, we speak of the scriptures. Let me flip the tape over while you flip over to John 5. The scriptures, John 5, are also an unlikely witness. Now, Jesus said to the crowds there in John 5, 31 to 33, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know the testimony he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he is born witness to the truth, which we've just read. But, he says in 36, the testimony I have is greater than John's. The works the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works I'm doing bear witness about me, that the Father has sent me. So you've got a prophet John bearing witness, and you have the works that he does. We read about Cana and a number of other things. Then in 39, he upbraids them about Moses. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, sometimes people read this and they say, see, you know, there you are with your Bible. You think you're going to be saved because of that. Like, well, yes, you are going to be saved if you accept the scripture's testimony about Jesus. If you read them and you don't accept their testimony, then no, you're not going to be saved. That's not going to help you. But of course you have to know what the Bible says about him because you don't know anything else about him. There is nothing else to be known about him. There's no other way to know about him. 
45th verse, don't think I will accuse you to the Father, said Jesus. There's one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. How does Moses accuse them? Well, in this way. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, because Moses wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? It's pretty clear, isn't it? We are still talking about the unlikely messenger. Moses wrote about Jesus, and it's true he did. Many places you can show in what Moses himself did or said, in addition to the five books of Moses, if you will. There's a lot of it. But he said, if you don't believe his writings, how do you believe my words? If you really believe what he said, the way the Samaritan woman at the well did, then you'd be looking for that Messiah. You would know that it was him. You would know something is up. We need to pay attention to this. But they don't. And in John 9, a blind beggar, my favorite one, personally, because of the humor. The dark humor of the blind man. <laughs> uh, 9 1, Jesus passes by, seeing a man who is blind from birth. He spits on the ground, verse 6, to make mud with the saliva, or I might say to make clay. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the clay and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam is a word that means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. All right, so the creator of all things, as we were told earlier, has made clay and given this man some new eyes, apparently. That's all right. No problems there. The fun starts then. <laughs> the neighbors of those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, isn't that the man who used to sit and beg? <laughs> Some said, yeah, that's him. And others said, hey, it looks like him. But he kept saying, I'm the man, it's me. And, you know, I, I read this with Nico recently. And he said, he's been sitting there for years He's wearing the same clothes. They saw him walk away and come back. How could they think he's not, it's not him? And like, that's the point, son. The reason they think it's not him is because they don't believe that it's possible for a blind man to regain his sight. They won't accept the sign that Jesus did. So they said, well, then how were your eyes opened? How did this happen? He said, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And that's true. It's exactly what happened. There's nothing else to this story. We've already got all the facts. <laughs> that's all there is to it. Now, people don't like it. It's like the creation. People don't like the story of the creation because they think it must have been done differently or taken longer or whatever. But it says what it says. It's rather, rather simple, actually. It's just a question of whether you accept it. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, how should I know? <laughs> you know, ask the blind man. He saw it too, you know. Why would you ask him where Jesus went? How is he supposed to know? He was blind. I love that. That's fantastic that he did that. I don't know. Why would he know? That's very silly. But it gets the point across, doesn't it? What an unlikely messenger, this blind beggar. Hmm. Well, what does this mean? 17th verse. The Pharisees questioning him said, what do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? He said, oh, he's a prophet. Ah, yes, now we have a problem. Because the Pharisees don't want Jesus to be a prophet. Instead of judging based on what happened and what is undeniably a sign from God. This man, whom everybody knows, who's been sitting there for years, blind from birth. They know it's him, but they're not willing to accept the conclusion that that means Jesus is a prophet. See, they're not thinking rationally, they're thinking emotionally. 24th verse, the second time they called to the man been blind, give glory to God, we know this man's a sinner. He answered, look, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, 
Though I was blind, now I see. There's only one thing that I understand here. I don't know this Jesus. I don't know anything about him. I do know that he told me to go wash my eyes, and I can see now. So they said, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? To which he replied, I already told you, and you wouldn't listen. So the man is exasperated, that's all. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> so now he's making fun of them, which is great. I think that's fun to do. Because they're not listening. He said, I already told you. This is the second time he's been brought in for questioning. And now the third time, they're like, well, how did this happen? He said, I already told you how this happened. I told everybody how it happened. It's very simple. But their response is telling. You are his disciple. We're disciples of Moses, whom Jesus just told us in John 5. They trust him incorrectly. They don't actually believe in Moses. If they did, they'd accept Jesus. We're disciples of Moses. We know God has spoken to Moses. As for this man, we don't know where he comes from. To which the blind man replies, well, this is an amazing thing. What? What's amazing? Congenital blindness has been healed? No. What's amazing is you don't know where he comes from. And he opened my eyes. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's true. This is an amazing thing. You don't know where he came from, but he opened my eyes. That's amazing. It's true. What a marvel. How do they refuse to accept this? Their response to him, of course, in verse 34 is, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And excommunicated him. So, you know, this one is disenfranchised from the synagogue and from the, you know, the powers that be. But then they believe it's because he was born in sin, because he's guilty. That's why he was born blind, of course. Which is not true at all. Jesus said very plainly, neither he nor his parents sinned. This is just for the glory of God. But their answer, would you teach us? That tells you what we're saying. Unlikely messenger. Not what they expected. Not what they were looking for. Not the one to whom they would give an ear and listen. Let's see if I can keep moving here. John 12. Another unlikely messenger is a guy that died. <laughs> You'd think that that guy's not going to come back and, and tell any more stories. At least that's what the mafia says in jail. But... In truth, Lazarus does come back. Lazarus comes back. And in John 12, he shows up at the Passover. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. So Lazarus was there at dinner, the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And there at the Passover, six days before the Passover, but I mean, they're, they're gathered where the public knows where they are, so that you have this, the large crowd of the Jews learned Jesus was there and came, not only on account of him, Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death too, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away believing in Jesus. Well, we can't have that happen. We're going to have to kill Lazarus, too. But what an unlikely messenger, right? Another. Where you just don't expect this, and yet it's very powerful, and it is also based on the Scriptures. The Scriptures that did these things. If you go back and look at the account of how Lazarus uh, was raised in John 11, you can see what Jesus said. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And, and other things that hearken back to the prophets. And in the end, John 20, the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest of the signs. Remember, we started with Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. And he was like, whoa, dude, mind blown. And Jesus was like, uh, really? That's nothing. Just you wait. Right? And now... You know, and you move up through the water of wine and all the different things. Now we have resurrection of Lazarus. Now we have resurrection of Jesus. John 20, a woman is the first one to see him. 
The first one to know that he's resurrected on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, still dark it was, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who was Jesus' friend, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. So the first of all, the testimony comes from Mary that Jesus is not in the tomb. Later, Mary Magdalene, Later, she's there alone, the disciples have left, and Jesus appears to her on recognizing, you know, she recognizes him, and he says to her at 17, John 20, 17, don't cling to me or don't touch me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Well, these are the things that he told them in the chapters prior. Mary Magdalene did exactly this. He went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and told them that he had said these things to her. Again, a woman. Um, she was there alone, but she's the one who saw the resurrected Lord first. She's the one through whom the message came to everybody else. What are you going to believe? Me, me or your lying eyes, right? Somebody else's eyes is an unlikely witness, an unlikely uh, uh, messenger in John 20. But Thomas, one of the 12, wasn't there when Jesus had come the first time. And the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, that he just didn't believe it. 24 to 25, he said, unless I see his hands and mark of the nails and put my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe it. So all the other disciples said so. Mary had said so, but more than that, the scriptures had said so. The scriptures said so. He just didn't accept it. He didn't understand it. So unless I see these marks, I won't believe. Interesting. But Jesus' reply to that on appearing to him in 29 is, Have you believed? Because you've seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Which to my thinking, should be rendered a little differently. It should be rendered as, you haven't believed because you've seen me, have you? Because it anticipates a no answer. This is the formulation that says, no, that's not belief. The scriptures gave this testimony. The apostles gave this testimony. He's resurrected from the dead. Jesus himself said he was going to do it, and this one wouldn't believe it. And Jesus said, the blessing is for those who have not seen and yet have believed. Believed what? The Gospel of John. 30 and 31. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All right. So the book is intended to bring you belief in his name, to help you to obey the Gospel of Jesus, to help you to understand he is the Son of God. He is the one God has chosen and sent. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Jesus has been sent into the world that we might have forgiveness, that we might have life in him. God wants for us to dwell with him and to be with him. If today you're not a Christian, we'll be glad to help you to obey the gospel of Jesus, putting him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins to call on him as your father, as Jesus told Mary. If you are a Christian who has not lived right, let us pray that you may be restored to God. We're all of us in need of prayers daily and, and uh, we ought to continue that way. Keep each other in mind. There's a lot of things to think about, but I come back to the simple point that the scriptures are the power the person or the means by which you hear these things is just a shell. It's really not important how the message gets to you. The importance is that message itself, the word of God that is the truth. That has to come through regardless of the method by which it reaches you. And if you love the truth, as the woman at the well did, you will respond to that. Do you love the truth? Do you want to obey the gospel? We're glad to help you if you need our prayers. If you need to be baptized, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.